owners, gym owners, and things like that. It's a kind of difficult conversation in the fitness industry, um, but it's a very important one because eating disorders and athletics and the fitness industry kind of go hand in hand much more than other industries do. And so it's also one that many people shy away from addressing, would rather ignore it and pretend it's not there. But it is there, and it's really dangerous. So thank you all for being here, and for Lauren as well, so being forward thinking enough to actually have a workshop like this. Um, I'm very open about my eating disorder. There is nothing, there isn't a question any of you could ask me that I haven't already written about, spoken about, podcasted about. So you can ask me anything. And you don't have to wait till the end for questions. I'd much rather, if you have a question, just ask it, although we can go through stuff at the end as well. Um, and so, first of all, though, I'd like to learn a little bit about you guys. And if anybody would like to sort of tell me why you came to this workshop, maybe what you do, what your interest is, then go for it. And if nobody, do, oh, thank you. Um, yeah. I'm a high school track coach. Um, so I, a girl high school track coach, so I work with, um, ages from like 14, 15 to about 18, 19. Um, so I just saw it as a very important um, workshop for me to attend because I have noticed or heard comments um, that are kind of, not alarming, but they get me thinking and being aware of girls, um, how they feel towards eating and especially their kind of how they should feel. Yes. interested and open to learn about some of the mindset and um, any type of mindset that I don't understand to make me a better leader. That's, that's so important because, well, one of the things I'm going to go into is it's often the, oh, somebody has to be stick thin to have an eating disorder and that it's, it's kind of the physical bit that's the problem. And the, the physical bit, the bit that you see with an eating disorder really is the tip of the iceberg thing. What's going on in here is insane. So I really actually do want to get into that and help people understand what it actually feels like in here if you haven't experienced an eating disorder um, and why that's so problematic. So that's great. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, so I, similar to in the back, I currently teach. Um, I'm just kind of interested in um, ways you can encourage or kind of redefine things or help redirect <coughs> conversations or thoughts um, about just health in general or body image or whatever it is with young girls or, or boys. Um, and then I'm also a, like Lauren, dance professionally. So I know I've had certain yeah. disordered thoughts yeah. and now I'm thankful to be like out of that mindset, but it's just interesting to me to kind of like she was saying, observe the headspace of it yeah. and try to wrap your head around it a little bit more in terms of, okay, what was so off about when someone said that to me? Why did I take that as a compliment or an insult yes. or whatnot? Yeah, that's a really fantastic observation. That has to do with the brain. We'll go into it more, but that's to do with the brain starting to become hyper aware around certain comments, anything to do with body, food, things like that that starts to develop when you have an eating, a different eating disorder is developing. But that's so that, that kind of experience is, is really important when you notice your own brain has started to pick up on things that mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't have done before. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I direct at UT Gillespie School in Santa Costa Mesa, and so just wanted to learn more about this and hopefully be able to empower our faculty and our yeah. parents to spot things early on before. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm a former dancer and a physical therapist who works with a lot of dancers. And I know the importance of nutrition for um, preventing injuries and rehabilitation. So to be able to understand better the psychology and some of the red flags is going to be super important. Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, I'm a dance studio owner. Um, and we actually have trained our staff in, in certain areas of eating disorder or disordered eating, um, but just understanding also how to listen to a child mm -hmm. or teen to come, when they come to you with an issue, being able to say the right things right. in the appropriate response. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The what to do is, is mm -hmm. hard as well. Yeah. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah, hi. <laughs> so as a parent <laughs> of uh, Lauren, of course, who struggled with this for so many years, 
I, I just was in the dark and I had so much guilt and fear and didn't really understand it. So even for me now, I never really researched it. Um, kind of put my head in the ground, I think, but monitored her in my own kind of way, but wanting to understand that pro those processes even more now. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's important to, from, from a parent's point of view, eating yeah. disorders are quite traumatic, yeah. and so parents usually have their own response to that trauma. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah. Anybody else? I saw another hand somewhere. No? Okay. So, we're going to start with, and like I said, if you have a question, just yell at me. Okay, just interrupt. <laughs> yeah. Because this stuff is complicated. <laughs> and it's, it's a lot to understand if you haven't directly experienced it, especially. Um, all right, so what is a restrictive <coughs> eating disorder? And so I've said restrictive eating disorders because with restrictive eating disorders, I'm covering anorexia, bulimia. Um, I actually consider binge eating disorder to be a restrictive eating disorder in the majority of cases as well. Um, so, so really covering all of these things here, because I often just talk about anorexia and then people who purge or have bulimia get a bit like, well, that doesn't apply to me because my classification is anorexia. Restrictive eating disorders are, is a huge umbrella. And just, um, on, you might think, well, what's restriction? Restriction is, is anything that has the intent to suppress one's natural body weight, to make one's body weight lower. I hope that makes sense. If anybody has any questions on that, we can go into. But so the other thing that people get a little bit tripped up on is they think, and I got tripped up on this myself because I developed anorexia, I didn't have a clue what it was. Um, and there's so much um, ideas that people have about what anorexia is. I thought anorexia was something that only affected teenage girls that were really body conscious, that didn't like their bodies, and that were vain. That's pretty much what I thought anorexia was. And I was a tomboy, and I rode horses, and I didn't even ever wear makeup, and I would, certainly wouldn't ever wear a dress. And so I didn't think I could get anorexia because I didn't want to. <laughs> um, so it's, it's important to understand that the, um, the, there's a lot of stigma around eating disorders and what they are. And this also comes into what it takes to have an eating disorder as such. And restriction doesn't necessarily mean that you're not eating, that you're completely starving yourself. What it means is that for a prolonged period of time, you're eating less food than your body needs to function. And so we call that energy deficit, because there's a deficit of your energetic needs. And actually, energy deficit is what most diets are based on. And um, so a restrictive eating disorder, body weight suppression. The other thing that I think doesn't get talked about enough in eating disorders is just how dangerous they are. Mm and just how deadly they are. <coughs> one of the problems and one of the reasons that this is, is because it's very rare that somebody dies and the doctor's gonna say they died of anorexia. Because what happens is they have a heart attack mm -hmm. or they commit suicide or any of these other things. It's very rare you're gonna see on someone's death certificate died of anorexia, died of bulimia, died of an eating disorder. But it happens really frequently. And so I think statistically, it's something like every hour, every 62 minutes, a person dies of directly from anorexia. And that's not taking into account all the other diagnoses. Um, but what it more commonly looks like is heart attacks, heart failure, um, and the depression that goes along with energy deficit. Because if you think about the body not having enough energy for such a long period of time to completely function, most people with restrictive eating disorders do get depressed. And so suicide is really high. If somebody commits suicide, it does not go down that they died of anorexia. Mm -hmm. And um, for anybody that's had a restrictive eating disorder for a long time, you'll understand why the suicide rate is so high. Um, it's just the mental torture that it is for just going on and on and on is really incredible. So. It's, it's the, the deadliness of it doesn't come off, up often enough. And I think a lot of the time it's a bit like, oh, an eating disorder won't do them any harm. It's really far from the truth. Um, so the other thing that is often really misunderstood is who gets anorexia. 
Like, I had anorexia, and I didn't think I had anorexia because I didn't think I was the type of person that could get anorexia because I thought that they were the type of person that got anorexia. And that wasn't me. There isn't a type of person, really, that gets anorexia. It doesn't discriminate every race. And the gender thing is really interesting as well because most people think it's a thing that it's a thing that women get. In my experience, it's a 50-50 men get eating disorders just as much as women do. They're just not diagnosed because they present slightly differently. Not all the time. I've worked with plenty of guys that have presented very underweight. But the majority of the time, it's maybe presented as a more of a orthorexia, super healthy, I'm a marathon runner, I'm a bodybuilder, I'm just completely obsessive about it. That can be an eating disorder, but it's not gonna get diagnosed because most general practitioners can't see eating disorders when they walk into their office mm -hmm. because there's a perception that for a person to have an eating disorder, they have to be female, they have to be white, and they have to be very thin. Mm -hmm. None of those things are true, and that's probably why the death rate's so high. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to talk about genetic predisposition because there's this big thing about what causes an eating disorder out in the world. And um, we do now, na now know thanks to people like Cynthia Buick, that there is a genetic locus for, say, anorexia nervosa. We can, we can narrow down where it lies genetically, which has been a really wonderful thing for eating disorder research and, and for those of us that for a long time have been saying, this is biological. This is a biological thing that's going on. Because I was somebody that didn't even like being thin. And yeah, I was you know, deathly thin for a very long time. And so, for me, it never felt like a psychological thing. And I would go to the, I went, whenever I went to the doctor, which wasn't very often because I started to realize they'd try and get me into treatment whenever I went, um, they'd start asking questions like, so what's it like at home? You know, how are your parents with you? And I'd just be like, oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> My parents are amazing. Don't tell them that. <laughs> They're amazing. You know, like I had a pretty idyllic children, so don't start trying to dig up like what's it like at home. I'm not saying that people who have traumatic upbringings don't have eating disorders. They do, but it's not true in the vast majority of cases. And I and it's also this perception that you must have been unhappy with your body forever. That's why you, you know, had decided to get an eating disorder. I was absolutely fine. Actually, as a 16-year-old, because I developed anorexia quite late, towards being 18. Mm. As a 16-year-old, I was actually one of the kind of body-confident, cocky little girls, like, you know, mm. like, I'm gorgeous. <laughs> 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 I was really quite like that. I was pretty obnoxious. And um, so that really didn't fit either. I didn't have any body image problems. And so that's another perception. It's just like people with eating disorders have body image problems. Oh, when I had anorexia, I had body image problems. But I, I hated being thin. <laughs> that didn't mean I wasn't terrified of eating, and it didn't mean I was ter wasn't terrified of gaining weight. And so for me, I just found it very frustrating when people would say to me, like, oh, I was so scared of like not being thin. I'd be like, I hate being thin. <laughs> like, I, I looked awful. And, um, you, you know, all of these other things that came into it, all these perceptions of what a person with anorexia should, should think or how they should feel and that they should really kind of be trying to have anorexia deep down. Um, and so I was a really body confident teenager. It really didn't make any sense that I developed anorexia. Mm -hmm. And there was always a part of me, whenever I was talking to doctors, treatment professionals, that was sort of screaming, I have, there's no reason for this to happen. Like, there was nothing in my background that would cause this to happen. There's nothing in my personality that would cause this to happen. And something I really knew right from the get-go that it was this biological drive. Mm -hmm. Like, something in me was causing it to happen that wasn't really controlled by me. And so the genetic research that's come out has really helped those of us that have always been saying this is not just a psychological kind of you know, trauma-based thing. Of course, if a person has trauma, that can be a contributing factor to an eating disorder. But contributing factor is different from cause. So eating disorders are caused by genetics and prolonged energy deficit. Those two things are needed. You need to have the genetic predisposition for one, and you need to go into prolonged energy deficit. Prolonged energy deficit doesn't have to be huge energy deficit. It doesn't have to be completely starving yourself. It can just be each day a little bit less than your body really needs. That can be prolonged energy deficit that goes on long enough. A contributing factor 
is something like diet culture. That's a contributing factor to eating disorders because it causes people to go into prolonged energy deficit. A traumatic childhood is a contributing factor because it can cause somebody to restrict their food and not eat enough. So anything that can cause that energy deficit, a person to not eat enough food for a prolonged period of time, could be considered a contributing factor. But it's very important that we understand that contributing factors are standalones, aren't causes. Because what happens in therapy and, and general eating disorder treatment a lot of the time is the contributing factors are treated and the energy deficit isn't. <laughs> yes? Um, Tabitha, would you liken this genetic uh, predisposition to the theories and the science behind um, young male adults who have the onset of schizophrenia around age 20, 21, if, who are genetically predisposed? Have you heard this before? Mm -hmm. Would you say that this, that as far as a genetic predisposition for an eating disorder goes, could it be the same kind of? So um, are you talking, you know, typical age of onset of anorexia is in teens. Is that the kind of thing that you're getting? Yeah, that's what onset? I'm wondering. If well, you think I think personally, I think and no, there isn't a straightforward answer to this, but personally, the reason I think that most people who develop eating disorders do it around their puberty teenage is actually because um, for most females, what happens before we go into puberty is our bodies are very intelligent and very smart, and the body goes like, oh, there's something big coming up. I'm going to store a little bit more fat to help my body get through it. So most teenage girls, just before they, get, they, they go through puberty, the body stores fat, which is brilliant. You think about it. <laughs> it's like being like, I'm going on holiday next month, so I better save some money. You know, it's nice. I'm like, something's up, something's going to happen. I'm going to store a bit more fat. It's going to help me deal with it. Brilliant. Apart from, we live in a culture that doesn't think that's brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so, teenage girl gains a bit more weight, and someone goes like, hmm, yeah, mm. you know, get a bit chubby, better wash that. And then she goes like, oh, really, should I? Okay, maybe I should eat less. Mm. So I think that's probably the reason that eating disorders often match the sort of puberty time, is that's the time when most girls start to develop a bit more. And then people make comments, mm. you know, and they think, oh, I should restrict, and that's what everyone's telling me to do. And so then I think that if that person has the genetic predisposition, that's a really great time for mm -hmm. the eating disorder to get activated. It's also not <coughs> true at all that people who are not teenagers don't get eating disorders. Like people can, you can get an eating disorder in any age of your life if you have the genetic predisposition, you go into energy deficit. My onset was 18, which is considered relatively late. Um, my onset was because I um, trained uh, racehorses. I was a training jockey, not a jockey jockey, because I'm way too tall to be a jockey jockey. <laughs> I was a training jockey. And um, because I'm tall, my weight naturally was a little bit above those little Irish tiny jockeys that are like four, <laughs> four foot. <laughs> and so that, you know, I just, need, I just wanted to lose like five pounds, just a little bit, so that I could actually ride this smaller horse. And I lost the five pounds, but it was also enough that that triggered my eating disorder, and then I couldn't start eating it. I just couldn't start eating normally again. And my weight just went, Ooh. and then I had 10 years of health that followed that. Um, so yeah, genetic predisposition. You can't tell by looking at someone if they have the genetic predisposition for an eating disorder or not. Just take it as that it's gonna be more common than you think it is, this genetic predisposition, yeah. Can you talk about um, prolonged energy deficit? How, can you describe how long is prolonged? More than a day, I guess. Um, it doesn't, you know, it differs from person to person, I think. For me, I really took a week where I ate a lot less. And because I was kind of the person, I was like, I need to lose five pounds, I'm going to do it all this week. And so I just, it, so that was, it was really for me, it, I remember that week, and it really was just a week where I ate a lot less. I've known people have their eating disorder triggered by, say, about a long bout of the flu. So um, it doesn't need to be ages, ages, ages. If you want to have a think about why why would a, why would human bodies some of them have evolved to have this genetic predisposition that when they don't eat enough this crazy thing starts to happen where they suddenly don't want to eat and they're scared of eating and most of us want to move a lot and if we look at animal models it's fairly obvious to me that's a migration response some animals migrate when food gets scarce some animals hibernate when food gets scarce I'm a migrating animal when food gets scarce. When my brain, my brain, you know, brainstem area, we're not thinking up here, because your logical brain knows, not, not food scarce, you're just not eating that much. Your brainstem area reacts to data, 
no your brain scan area knows is like the data says there's not enough food in this environment. And humans have evolved over thousands and thousands of years. And thousands and thousands of years ago, famine would have been the biggest threat to the human race. So we have these evolved responses to when our brains think that there's not enough food in the environment. I migrate when, there's, when my brain thinks. And migrating animals move a lot and don't stop to eat. Mm -hmm. And so for a migrating animal, to stop to eat could actually mean that you don't survive because you don't get to where you're going. To search for food in an environment where food is scarce could mean that you don't migrate successfully and you die. And so there's this fear of feeding behaviors. And we can, we in, in many species of animals, so like pigs, for example, there's a certain species of pigs, that if you put them in a pen and you restrict their food, what starts to happen is they start to pace the pen and then when you give them grain, they won't eat it. But they'll eat straw and they'll eat forage foods. The animal's migrating, they call it anorexic pig syndrome. It's migrating. The animal is, the, the, it's, you know, that's, so it's not like the animal sits there and thinks like, well, there's not enough food around, so I guess I guess like move a lot and eat very little. It's not a conscious thing. In the same way it wasn't with me, that I just like, well, you know, I'm severely underweight, but I guess I should just go and like run a marathon or two and not eat anything. Like, it's not a conscious thing. The animals don't make those migration decisions. It's just a genetic prompt when the environment signals that food is scarce. Mm -hmm. and. If you think about a migrating bird that's got to fly across the ocean, that bird can't stop to eat. <laughs> <laughs> that's not going to help. So migration is kind of intense, and it's insane, actually. You can think all of these species of animals that do that, certain types of human have the genetic predisposition, the predisposition for that as well, and some people don't. I guess it depends what tribe we are in, we came from, and whereabouts of the world we came from, and if migration would have been a thing. Human migration is a thing, <laughs> and um, and so that's what that's when I'm talking about biological approach to eating disorders. That's what I'm talking about. We're looking at what we're looking at other species of animals. We're looking at things that happen in species of animals, and like it's not just this huge coincidence that everybody that develops an eating disorder has been in energy deficit. They didn't eat enough food at some point. That's always how it starts. <laughs> it's, it's, so it doesn't just come out of nowhere, but. If you think about diet culture, everyone's on a diet. Not everybody gets anorexia. That's where the genetic component comes in. Or a, another type of restrictive eating disorder, not just anorexia. <laughs> um, so the suppression of one's body weight. One of the, something that is, is true across all eating disorders is that the suppression of one's body weight becomes compulsive. It becomes out of your control. It's not just this thing that you, you, know, you feel like doing, it's this thing that unless you do it, you feel a huge amount of anxiety, unless you're suppressing your body weight. And suppression of one's body weight can happen in lots of different ways. When we think of a person with anorexia, we just think of them starving themselves, not eating. Yeah, suppression of one's body weight. Bulimia, we think of someone purging. That is suppression of one's body weight. Um, it, it, laxative use, like, compulsive exercise is one that's way not addressed as, enough. And I was, I had awful compulsive exercise. Um, and it's, the, the compulsive exercise piece is probably what's gonna be really relevant to a lot of you guys and people that you'll see, because, you know, like anything is good to a point. <laughs> exercise can be really, really, really harmful if it's compulsive. And it can be deadly if somebody is exercising in an under-resourced, underweight body. I think I couldn't st can't stress that point enough that when the body is under resourced, every single system in that body is affected. Every system in our body needs energy. If you start taking energy away from the body, every single system is affected. And so then exercising on top of that, which increases the energetic demand, that's really, really dangerous. And I presented at my doctor's half the body weight I am now. And I, you know, <laughs> I'd also, I didn't lie necessarily, although I did lie a lot when I had an eating disorder, but they'd say, you know, like, what are you doing? What are you eating? And I'd tell them I was eating because that was true. I never completely starved myself. I always ate something, fruit and vegetables mostly, but it was true that I was eating. And I'd tell them that I worked out. And not one doctor ever said to me, I don't think that's a good idea that I was working out because doctors are taught that exercise is good for us mm -hmm. always <laughs> that's mm -hmm. not always true 
I did get banned from two gyms. So I had multiple gym members memberships when I had an eating disorder because I was aware that people might cotton on to it. Like, I was basically in the gym all day. And, you know, so I went to multiple different gyms. And I did get banned from two gyms. But, um, because, and that, that shows the compulsive element. Like, I didn't, they didn't just ban me outright. Like, the gym manager would call me into the office and say, yeah, people are concerned, you're here all the time, and you're very underweight. She didn't know what to do. She didn't know what was going on. Um, and I'd score blind, I didn't have an eating disorder. Um, and so she'd give me a warning and say, they even uh, don't come in as much, and I'd still continue to come in as much. And then she gave me a written contract saying I was only allowed to come in once a day, and I still continue to come in more than once a day. Like, it's insane how, when you have this compulsion to do something, all, all the threats and all of the logic just doesn't make any sense, and then I get banned. So I went and joined another gym. Um, anyway, so I digress. But I've, I've actually talked quite a bit so far, so does anybody have any questions on what we've gone through so far? We talked yeah. about the migration, so what's the, the, so the opposite would be a hibernation? Yeah. What, and so what, how does that manifest itself? Like what does that look like for somebody? It looks, like, it's looks, it looks like the person that you might see that's in a much larger body, might be classed as clinically obese. And you look at that person, and most people would judge that person and say, well, you must be lazy and just eat all the time. That's what's happened with you. What's actually happened is that person has probably res restricted the majority of their life. And their genetic reaction to restriction is to lower metabolism and save. So just like the bear does, when the bear's environment, the food starts to get less, that bear's reaction is, I'm going to eat a load of food and then sleep. And the bear's body lowers metabolism magnificently. And so some people's bodies are very genetically prone to, as soon as they, their body perceives that there's scarcity in that environment, they're going to lower metabolism. They're going to store fat. And so for a lot of people, this is so important actually, I'm really glad you asked this. For a lot of people, they might naturally, because body diversity is a thing, so some people might naturally be beautifully happy and healthy in a body that's say BMI 24. But a doctor doesn't like that. The doctor says, that's too high. You shouldn't be there. You should go on a diet. And so they restrict food. And then that person's body lowers metabolism. They can't maintain the restriction because they're fighting their biology. And so they start to eat again with a lower metabolism and they pile on a load more weight and they end up in a higher BMI. So they're told to go on a diet again. And this continues. And that's why, I mean, there's so there's a lot of scientific evidence out there that diets just don't work. And in people in larger bodies, when they go on a diet, they usually end up in an even larger body. I think that the, the one thing that I think I have really learned throughout my lifetime when working with hundreds of people with eating disorders in all size bodies, is that when we try and fight our biology, really bad things happen, one way or the other. Because these, these bodies are designed to respond to perceived famine. When our bodies don't think there's enough food in the environment, they will respond and they will try and protect themselves. And so that's the most common thing that we actually see, I think. People being told to go on a diet, and their, their BMI is just going up over years. Um, the, and this also brings into, you can't tell if somebody has a restrictive eating disorder by looking at them. Because say if a person is in naturally a larger body, they could start working out obsessively. It's restricting a lot. They could maybe get their bodies down to a BMI like 22, 23. That's not super skinny that person still has a restrictive eating disorder because they are suppressing their natural body weight. Their body naturally at unsuppressed weight would be higher. And their body and their mental state is still gonna react as if they're in, they have a restrictive eating disorder. And so that's why these things are so dangerous. <laughs> and and that's, that's why it's so important to start to understand what we can do when we start trying to, you know, some meddle with people's natural unsuppressed body weight. And if we try and fight body diversity, which is a thing. Across all species <coughs> of animal, body diversity is a thing. Um, any other questions? Okay. So, compulsive suppression of body, one's body weight can look a lot of different ways. I've talked about compulsive movement, various forms of purging, 
rigid, rigid ritualized behaviors. This is one of the first things that you might start to pick up on on something, somebody when they're developing an eating disorder, because not everybody loses a drastic amount of weight. You just might start to pick up on this rigidity. This start, especially many of us get very routine and we want to do the same thing every day. So rigidity in workout schedules, time, just, just things if you might just notice in someone, especially if it's a family member, it's way easier. You might just notice that they're getting really rigid about things. The person that used to be like, well, I usually work out on a Saturday morning, but actually let's go for breakfast today. Can't do that anymore. They seem to start getting really stressed about that sort of thing, actually. And they start to stop doing social stuff because they want to keep their rigid workout routine. That can be one of the first things that you start to notice. Um, and so healthy eating as well, classed as or called orthorexia, I guess is, it was what you would consider to be destructively <coughs> healthy eating. <coughs> but it, that's also not really obvious. And a lot of the time you just might think, well, you know, that's good for them. They're, they're eating you know, a healthy variety of food. They're, they're trying to change their diet for the better. It's kind of when it starts getting rigid. Yeah, you know, it's great to eat your greens and stuff like that, but if you then start to really bulk at going out for that cheeseburger a couple of times, you know, once a week or so that used to be there and used to be quite relaxed about, that's when you might sort of see like, oh, there's some problems coming in. When it starts to actually look like it's having an emotional effect on that person to change their routines, and I'll get into the, the emotional component in there. I think I've talked a bit about weight loss, so it's just the main point being there that, um, Although severe weight loss is often a symptom of an eating disorder, it's not always, by any means. And you can't tell by looking at a person if they have a restrictive eating disorder. So important. Um, compulsive movement. Has anybody had any experience with compulsive movement? Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Actually, I have a bit, too, with making sure our front door is locked. <laughs> <laughs> Compulsive movement can be really, really diverse in what it looks like. Um, so at the height of my eating disorder, I was, um, in, say, doing what I would call intense workout for um, six hours a day, no less. So I'm talking something at running. Most of the time it was running. I used to run for six hours a day in two hours stints. Um, all the time that I, and this is, I was a really extreme case of compulsive movement. I just want to give an illustration of what that looks like. So I, I would run two hours in the morning, two hours at lunchtime, two hours in the evening. And while I wasn't running, um, I also, I never sat down during the day. I would not be able to sit in a chair like this. I, I couldn't sit down during the day. Um, so I'd be the person that was kind of like always standing in the corner, fidgeting, foot to fit. Um, in my, I was at university at the time, so that was what my lectures looked like. I was the weirdo standing at the back, kind of like shifting from foot to foot, trying to take notes while standing up. Um, I, if I was ever in a situation, or I didn't put myself in any situation,